This is the session on electric vehicle charging uh, stations for corporations. I'm, I'm really excited about this event. I have three uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelists here, and we're really hoping to have a, uh, a dialogue about some of the challenges, some of the solutions that each of their organizations are working through as they implement their workplace charging uh, uh, programs at their, at their companies. So just quickly, my name is Josh Boone. I'm the senior manager uh, at, the, at the California Plug-in Electric Vehicle Collaborative. Um, I'm not going to speak long, so don't worry. We'll move quickly to the, to the uh, panelists. Um, we are a public-private partnership based in Sacramento, California, with the sole goal of trying to bring more plug-in electric vehicles to uh, the state of California and to our roadway. So, so just quickly, I want to pause and find out from the audience how many of you drove a plug-in electric vehicle to this summit today? I think we have three and one on the panel, so uh, hopefully that will continue to improve. The next question I want to ask you, uh, which really sets the context for this panel, is uh, how many of you drive your plug-in electric vehicles to work, and if you do, does your workplace or organization offer workplace charging? Because that's really the kind of the focus of, of this session. So we've got two. And we've got three on stage for sure. Great. Well, hopefully that continues to expand. Um, just quickly, the collaborative's membership, as you can see, is made up of a wide variety of stakeholder groups from the California State Energy Agencies uh, to most of the automakers, local government, um, the key utilities, and of course, the environmental and educational NGOs and um, the network providers. So our goal is to bring these different sectors together around a common table to kind of collaborate, convene, and communicate on uh, issues related to bringing more plug-in electric vehicles to market. Our organization last year, um, uh, during our strategic planning meeting, uh, determined that one of the things that we wanted to focus on for 2013 um, is infrastructure, charging infrastructure, and specifically charging infrastructure at workplaces and around multi-unit dwellings. So that kind of brings us uh, to this topic today. Just quickly, the collaborative has a series of workplace charging initiatives that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, we have a technical working group that is doing a series of surveys uh, of companies around the state to try to document what their best practices are uh, in this workplace charging space and work together to look uh, for solutions. We're also working on a series of decision-making guides. So these would be guides that would help employers, employees, figure out how to go about doing this whole workplace charging uh, thing. We are in partnership with CalStart. Uh, they are develop they have an EV employer initiative and they're developing a, a workplace charging best practices guide and I'm under the impression that uh, they're in the final stages of finishing that document. So if there are company representatives in the room that are interested in this space but aren't quite sure, uh, you know, kind of some of the best practices, stay tuned, that will be coming soon. The other thing I'm excited to announce is one of our signature events this year is called Drive the Dream. That's there in bold. This is a um, Department of Energy funded effort to encourage uh, workplace charging around the state of California. So we're, uh, along with the governor hosting this event, we are looking uh, to California CEOs to come and make specific commitments around workplace charging. Uh, buying plug-in electric vehicles for their uh, companies, their fleets, or some kind of incentive program to really kind of ramp up or amp up PEVs in the state. So if that's something that interests you, please please come see me. And, that, and last but not least, um, the US uh, DOE's Workplace Charging Challenge uh, is something that many of the Silicon Valley companies are uh, involved with, but basically uh, it's a companies make pledges to um, put in workplace charging or scale up the, the workplace charging program that they have. And we at the Collaborative are, um, since we're a public-private partnership, we're an ambassador for this program. Just quickly, uh, the DOE Workplace Charging Challenge launched in January of this year, uh, and to date they have 48 uh, uh, partners. So um, I know that a few of the panelists here on the stage are part of that program. So that's, that's really exciting. So quickly, I want to just introduce my panelists here, and then we'll um, have a little moderated Q&A, and then we'll save some time at the end for, for questions. So here, close to me, is Jessica Hiera from Facebook, and next to her is Claudia Rhodes from Juniper Networks, and Brian uh, Glazebrook from NetApp. So thank you all for, for being here. 
So I think, let me. So why don't we start off with you, um, Jessica, and just we'll walk, walk down the line here. Just kind of give an overview of, of, I don't think Facebook needs a lot of description in terms of what you do, but just kind of a quick company profile. We'll go down the line and then we'll come back and drill into your workplace charging program. And I've got your, your slide up, so. Great. So we have, uh, basically Facebook is, is mission is to be, make the world more open and connected. Um, we have 4,900 employees worldwide in 24 countries um, and 48 cities around the world. Um, at headquarters, we have um, about 3,200 employees right now, um, and we are in nine buildings that has about a million square feet um, and 3,100, almost 3,200 parking spaces. However, we are growing and uh, actually have the, the capability of upping the headcount at our headquarters to double what we are today to 6,600 with about 3,200 parking spaces. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Claudia with um, Juniper Networks. Our company is also based in Sunnyvale. Uh, we have about 3,500 employees right now on about 1.3 million square feet. Um, we just opened a new campus that we own um, in Sunnyvale, so we're split 50-50, so a lot of what I'll be talking about today is focused on the new campus. Um, I don't know, you guys know Juniper Networks, I guess you tell a little bit about our company, right? Yeah. So we're a networking company. Our motto is to connect everyone everywhere, and um, we try to do that using a network. So um, we're going to be talking a little bit about today about how we developed our charging station program. Uh, we have about 30 500 parking spaces, I believe, um, on the property. So we do have a one-to-one -one ratio with our employees right now, but um, with the amount of electric vehicles coming on board, uh, we're having to shift that over to uh, charging stations, which we'll talk about. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Glazer with NetApp. I'm the uh, Global Sustainability Manager. Um, uh, NetApp is based in Sunnyvale. It's a B2B company. Unless you probably don't know it if you're not going to go to the store and buy a NetApp appliance. Um, but we uh, sell uh, storage software and data management uh, storage devices for data centers, enterprise uh, storage, et cetera. Um, in Sunnyvale is our headquarters campus. We've got uh, about 4,000 employees, 13 buildings with about 1.65 million square feet. Um, we just started the EV charging this year, um, uh, and it's, it's taken a little bit of a while. We can talk how we got to that point. Um, and, but it, was definitely employee driven, uh, and uh, that's one of the, part of the, you know, part of the reputation of NetApp as being a great place to work. Uh, I think we're ranked six this year, and this is sort of an, an aspect of being a great place to work is providing the service to our employees and amenity. So. Great. Well, let's move right into um, the questions I have for you. Let's dive into your uh, workplace charging specific programs, and why don't you tell us a little bit about? Um, can I give us an overview of? The, the number of employees that are driving PEVs and are charging, kind of an overview of your, the number of stations, and, um, and then we'll go from there kind of into what your decision-making process was uh, and your kind of motivations and drivers for putting in workplace charging. So let's just start with Jessica. I'm gonna put up this summary slide here, which we'll leave up for the duration of the session. Yes, so currently um, we have 12 level one chargers 25 level two chargers and one DC fast charger. Um, we are looking to add another 11 chargers in the near future um, that will be dual chargers. Um, we have about 133 registered EV users um, and about 75 use uh, you know the plugins on a regular basis. Um, we probably have about 50 or so, 50, 56 um, parking spots for the current fleet that we have now or the current charging stations we have now and provide multiple parking spaces for each charging station. And I'll go a little bit more into why, that, uh, why later. But um, some of the decisions on why we provide that is because we definitely want to provide sustainable transportation solutions for our employees um, across the board. And EV is definitely a piece of that. Um, it is also a benefit. Um, you know, it, it is also a recruiting and retention. We probably have about a third of our employees that live in San Francisco. San Francisco, there isn't quite a lot of places to, to charge, and so a lot of our employees rely on the charging stations at work um, to get their charge. That's great. 
Uh, so for Juniper, we started um, with level one. So if you're not familiar with what level ones are, level ones is just your typical 110 household outlet. Uh, level two is your 240, so it's a little bit better. It, fa it charges a little bit faster. Um, and so most of the charging stations that are out there will actually be um, level twos is what we're seeing right now. So we started about four or five years ago. We had maybe four level one outlets, so just regular 20 amps, and nobody was really using them. And then last year, you know, breaker tripped. I went out, flipped the switch, okay. Next day, breaker tripped. So we went out to go see what was going on. People actually started bringing their electric vehicle char their electric vehicles in, and they thought they could plug into both outlets at the same time. What we discovered is whoever installed those originally put 120 amp with uh, two outlets on it, and that obviously doesn't work very well. Um, so at that point, about that was about a year ago, um, I upgraded those to uh, level twos. We put in the right type of infrastructure, and that was also the same time we were starting to develop our, our um, new campus across the street. Uh, from those properties. And so I worked with the construction team. We decided how many we needed to put in, the type of infrastructure, and where they were going to be located. Um, part of developing this program for electric vehicles, charging stations, is, a, is twofold. One, you have to decide whether you're really going to invest in it or not. You can't just dip your toe into it. If you don't have enough stations, you're going to have more problems, um, and it's better to take them out. So you either you have to go full force and do it, or decide not to do it. Um, so our decision was to move forward with it. It was really ramping up. Um, just this last year in January, February, it just was, uh, it exploded. I, I believe that Nissan came out with a new leasing um, option and I had in within 45 to 60 days at least another 50 employees um, who asked to use the stations. So uh, we only had four back in December and um, with the plan that we were just gonna install the rest of them in the garage when it opened this past June. And um, so the last few months has been really tough until we open the garage with the additional stations. Um, but part of you know, managing the whole pro uh, program is understanding how many of your employees actually use them. Mm -hmm. So I have, out of the 3,500 employees in Sunnyvale, I have 80 registered today, 81 registered today, but you know, we, I get about two requests a week um, to be added to those stations. So we are, uh, like Facebook, uh, we're looking to add 12 more stations um, before the end of the summer. Um, and then I've also um, provided our construction team a full uh, program on what days we need to be adding how many charging stations to keep up with our headcount right, and, and the demand. So, so uh, I'm the uh, beneficiary of, of this sort of development at, at NetApp. I've only been there a year and, and this has been thought about for a little while and just kind of took a little while in terms of budgeting and approvals and all that to get going for level two chargers. Um, on campus, we've got uh, these um, uh, vehicles uh, that, that the uh, maintenance staff uses that are a plug-in, and they were using the level one charts. So we have about uh, 12 now on campus that, that actually are being used by that, by that group. But as the, you know, really the, the, the rollout of EV chargers, especially the, the level two on campus, was really driven by the employees. And so a couple years ago, there were about two, uh, a survey was done uh, prior to when I joined the company, but there were about two people, two, three, that actually had an EV ve vehicle. Um, and there are about 15 or 20 or so, I think, that, that wanted to have one or were thinking about having one and said they'd buy it if they came to camp. Um, that had, we'd sent out another survey about a year ago when we were rolling out in this, this plan to implement the level two, and that, that number of uh, owners leaped up to, you know, in the 30s and 40s range and up into the hundreds for people who'd like to. Now, you, you obviously have to discount that a little bit, you know, uh, what people want to do versus what they're going to do, but that made it very clear that the level one, the, the plugs essentially in the garage, uh, that we were already seeing were problems because they, the EV owners were crowding out the actual maintenance guys in their vehicles because they, you know, they, even if the space was dedicated to maintenance or to the facilities, it, people would still park there and plug their car in. So we realized it was going to be a challenge and the data in a survey confirmed that. Um, and so uh, the budget had been had been in there and, and, and eventually got a, got approved. So we were able to put in all this all these equipment and and put them all in at once uh, in April of this year. And you know we we had the equipment early in the year and we took time through that pro to, to we didn't just as soon as we got it implemented. I mean it takes a little time to get the electrician and all that, but we made sure to have a process in place for how to deal with you know issues with employee using the chargers. Uh, before we actually had everything sort of a go live date in, in early April, so. That's great. 
Um, I know you each touched on this a little bit, but one of the questions I get asked in our survey work is, what was the real kind of top two drivers for uh, your for companies to install workplace charging? I mean, did you get out ahead of the curve and see that uh, this was going to be something that you could use to your advantage in terms of recruiting employees as you or retaining them, as you mentioned, Jessica? Or was it really driven by the demand of your employees saying, "Hey, you know, I have an electric car. Or I would like to get an electric car. Is this something you're going to offer me at work to extend my e miles or allow me to charge because I live in a condo and don't have charging?" So I'd like to hear. Uh, a little bit more about that, I think the audience would as well. So maybe Jessica, you can start and, and breathe a little life into that. Yeah, I think it's a combination of the two. I think initially we thought, we saw that this was coming as a trend, um, but the amount that we were putting in, I mean, that's really tough to gauge. And so we surveyed and polled our employees, but really just seeing the usage and same thing, probably at least one to two folks every week that, that want to come in and, and become part of the network to start charging. Um, and, you know, we've got high tech employees and they're very early adopters. And so trying to keep up with the demand is, you know, is a challenge, but I think you know, we try our best to kind of get a, a hold on that and put in additional infrastructure um, before even getting all of the charging when we do do work like that so that it's ready to go once and it's less trenching later down the line. Great. Yeah, very similar to with, with us. Um, like I said before, it started out as, well, we figured it's coming. Nobody expected it to come this fast. And um, so now it's more of a demand. Um, so we've, I've, we've hustled um, really quickly to try to figure out where we are today, where we need to be in a year, two years, so that we can plan out how many to install. Um, and similar to you, we're, we've already put the infrastructure in, so we know exactly what we're going to do in each garage as we start building on the campus, what we need at the existing buildings. Um, so we have the infrastructure ready to go. It's just, um, you know, basically pulling the trigger to say, go ahead and, and do it. So, and some of these um, charging station companies, there's a lot out there. Um, their new technology is coming out all the time. So, you know, if you're considering it, take a look at what they have today, but maybe what they're looking at in six months. It's changing, you know, every few months because all the technology that they're able to put into these charging stations. Um, even solar power, you know, I, well, sorry, we'll get there. But even solar power charging stations is out there, right? I mean, they're expensive, um, but there's a lot of different options out there. So I, I think for the most part, it's trying to meet the demand today and then plan for um, the immediate future because it's growing very rapidly. So if you, if you have an answer, please. Well, no, I was going to say that So we have, every week uh, and then we have a new hire orientation at the beginning. And one of the stories I give is how we got to this point and talk about employees being engaged. And, 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 and uh, I'd like to thank Tesla. Is anybody from Tesla here, Tesla Motors? Uh, for <laughs> OK, th thank you for creating this uh, incredible rush of, uh, uh, sarcastically, um, <laughs> creating this incredible rush of demand for vehicles. Not everybody can afford a Tesla, but it seemed for some reason to have triggered an interest in things like the Volt and the Leaf. And, and we get it, between two and sometimes five requests through our process to get access to our system every week. Um, you know, we have about 95 registered users now. Our utilization is about 75% for all of our 31 stations that we have on our campus. Um, but, you know, part of it is the, the competitive aspect, and we're not going to give away free food like Facebook or Google. Um, but this is an opportunity to meet uh, a demand from our uh, uh, employees and, and included, uh, you know, a number of executives, which obviously have a little bit of leverage. So, so, so let's talk a little bit about the benefit piece. Um, you know, some organizations, I think Facebook and others, uh, provide workplace charging for free. Mm -hmm. Others charge. Uh, either nominal fee or they're charging by hour, by kilowatt hour. So can you tell me a little bit about, and this gets, I think, into the management discussion, because as you scale up your charging system and you have more cars, uh, you know, how do you manage the, the new demand? And are you managing it through price signals? Um, maybe you can take that one, Brian. Sure. Well, I mean, unlike actually a lot of companies, we actually, uh, the employees are charged for the electricity they're using, too. So they have, we, we've created a process where they have to go through a number of steps and sign a waiver and get a placard and a number of things and, and register with the, the service we're using, which is ChargePoint, um, and, and get access to our stations. And then we, they get charged. Uh, there's a, a service fee and uh, an hour, basically a 14 cents a kilowatt hour rate, an average of our utility rate across the campus. Um, and you know, we kind of, I, I, discussion went from you know should it be free to should we try and charge back the you know 
the cost of all the infrastructure equipment. And I think we were trying to tread the line between you know, trying to tr generate revenue, which didn't go with this whole great place to work concept for us, to you know the the whole free part also would have been a challenge because that uh, for us it was showing you know we didn't want to show preferential treatment to one group or another. Not everyone can afford or wants an electric car, and we weren't about to install uh, you know a, a gas station on our campus or a natural gas charging station. So we you know this that was our kind of the how we how we tread the middle, and it's actually it helped. It's actually helped. I think, like I said, 75% utilization rate. I think people don't, if they don't need to charge, they don't charge. And that's a good way to maintain, sort of create, avoiding fist fights and other things that we do. And you know, we've also put two parking spots per one charger so that once somebody's done after four hours, the other person next door can, can plug in. So we essentially have spaces for 60 plus cars. So those two parking spots per charger, um, yeah. there's just one charger. There's just one charger, yeah. So someone can pull in and essentially get right. in queue. Right. And is there a price signal change, or is it just a flat fee? It, it's a it's a it's an hourly rate. Okay. Um, you know, plus there's like I said, there's a fee in there, and uh, um, and we're going to revisit the, what the rate would be every year, depending on what we're going to be paying for electricity. So I, mean, I think the ballpark is for a four-hour charge. It's you know, if you add in the chart, the fee, it's about you know, two and a half to three dollars. Okay. You know, a charge. So. Thank you, and Jessica, can you maybe speak to Facebook? I, I think you offer workplace charging for free as a benefit to your employees. How you um, are managing that? I, I know you mentioned earlier through your unique platform. So talk a little bit about that and how you've organized internally. Yes. Yeah, so um, it is free for employees as a benefit, um, and we do use the Facebook platform, which has worked very well for us. Um, and so everybody's part of a group um, for EV owners on site, and. Folks, because it's free, can just leave their uh, their plug open, and so when somebody comes in, it's all networked. So when somebody comes in to charge and they're charging, they get an alert for when it's, uh, or they can go in to see when it's. They don't get an alert, but they're working on that. So I'll touch on that a little bit. But they can go in and see when it's completely charged, and then can go down and unplug and plug in to somebody else's uh, for them because it is free and it doesn't matter. You know, it's free to everybody. So. Um, and then one of the other things that I've noticed too is on the platform that um, you know we put up our best practices and that kind of information on that platform. But in addition to that, people if somebody's port is closed, we'll message out and say, hey, you know I unplugged, it's free, but I noticed your port was closed. So if you want to go down and charge, so it's it's very social, it's very um, easy. They kind of work it up, work it out amongst themselves. Um, but as the, as the parking lot gets full, it may become a bigger challenge. So that's why I think dual charging um, stations will, will be beneficial for us. But as I mentioned, um, they are looking to hack the system in some way so that, um, that it will give alerts to folks when they, when they are done. So. Great. Do you want to speak to the model you're using at Juniper? Sure. So um, it does come down to managing the program. So you can't just put a station in and just leave it. If you decide to do that, you actually have to have some sort of a program surrounding that. Um, industry standard is three to one ratio, so three drivers to each station or two drivers to each station. Um, so that's what I think, as we talked before, most of us are at that. We're, Juniper's a little behind, but we'll be caught up soon. Um, but we do not charge at this point, um, but we are in the midst of reviewing um, all of our stats so we can decide how much to charge. Um, what we've done, very similar to Facebook, is we got lucky. Um, the employees with only four stations uh, for about four or five months um, ended up creating their own group um, within our company, so it's the EV group, and they all talk to each other and they tell each other, they email each other or text each other, I'm leaving now, there's a space available, who wants it, and they all talk to each other, it's great. So I got into that group and I started owning that group now. Um, I also asked, instead of dealing with 81 or 100 EV owners, um, I, re I asked for three volunteers to represent the entire group. And so now we have an EV council, and this is where we actually talk about how Juniper can help these EV drivers, um, how our program can be better defined um, to meet their needs. So one of the things we actually talked about is fee schedules. And uh, we had a great open conversation a couple weeks ago about this, um, and it seems like the consensus out there is maybe two, so the average charging, um, by the way, is about three and a half hours for uh, each session mm -hmm. um, at our particular property. Um, so the idea is maybe we charge, there's two different ideas, either charge free, no charge for two or three hours, and then incrementally start charging, um, start charging a fee, 
Um, the other option is to charge a fee during inactive charging only. And what that does, it will be an incentive for people to move their vehicles. So the whole idea of having charge of having stations out there, and we have duels, so all of ours are duels, is that um, you're supposed to share. I know we all learned when we were children, you have to share. <laughs> um, I find these engineers sometimes don't like to share all the time. Um, or, you know, they get caught in meetings and don't want to go down and move their vehicles. So as an incentive, and this actually came from the EV group owners, um, they actually asked if we could not charge during active charging, but once the vehicle stopped charging but it's still plugged in, could we then go ahead and charge a fee, whether it's five, ten dollars. They were willing to do that to incentivize the owner to move his vehicle and get out um, and go to another space so somebody else could come in and charge. So uh, we're in that midst right now, so it looks like we'll probably start charging somewhere in August 1st. We just haven't figured out what that fee schedule will be yet, but there's a lot of different fee schedules out there. Great. One of the things that um, our organization is learning, again, through our survey process, is that some organizations that are trying to manage their workplace charging um, are wrestling with uh, uh, how to treat different uh, plug-in electric vehicle technology types. So, of course, we have the full battery electric vehicles, like the Nissan LEAF, that uh, run off of their uh, the energy from the battery. And then we have the vehicles like the Chevy Volt, a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. And so, in some cases, we're learning that, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out if they should be giving preferential treatment to one technology type or another. And I'm wondering if that's coming up uh, as you manage your, your programs and how you're mitigating that. As far as the type of plug that the vehicles have? Well, just the, just the vehicle type. So, for example, oh, a, a they're, drive... They're all a standard plug? No, no, I just mean Tesla. in terms of like a Nissan LEAF driver may come to work and say, look, I get access to the charging station because it's essential for me to make my next trip uh, to charge. You know, I need to charge to be able to make my next, next trip. A Chevy Volt owner, uh, you know, may not need to have that charge. And so I know there's a couple of organizations in Los Angeles that are really struggling uh, with that and how to kind of work through that. So I'm curious... Uh, how you got, if that's been an issue, if, if it's been a non-issue, or if you're mitigating that through uh, any kind of creative solutions. No. It's Should we attack the Tesla person? No, 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 no. Okay. I don't want to say. No, I mean, I, I, I will say for us, we, we did have some leaf owners that were making comments in when we had a sort of a town hall on this new thing. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I have a leaf, I live in, you know, Marin or something, and I'm driving down, and, you know, I'm dead. And, and part of that is, well, you know, I hate to say it, it's, it's there, it was their conscious decision to live so far away and have a, a car that gets, you know, has a short miles range, but the other advantage for us, at least in terms of charging, is that I see so many, uh, so many. I mean, I see a number of like Tesla owners, for example, who won't be parking in the EV spaces because they don't need to, and so that's why you know, our utilization rates at 75 percent, which you know is okay because it allows us to you know deal with growth in uh, these vehicles, but also you know I think inherently it's we, we've again we've kind of outsourced the management or the the social management to the very active EV group, which has a distribution list similar to what you, you're saying, and I'm not on that because apparently that's this massive flow of traffic, right, to fill up your inbox in, you know, 10 minutes. But they're very engaged, and they kind of work around themselves. Um, so the advantage of having that extra sort of buffer, if you will, of spaces, and the people with the vehicles that don't need it realizing they don't, not parking there, I think it's been helpful. Okay, that's great. Yeah, how's, yeah. how's Facebook handling that, if at all? Currently we don't have that issue, um, but I think probably... At this point, I, I wouldn't foresee us giving preferential treatment. I think it's more of a they'll self-manage. Um, you know, like I said, they, they're very willing to unplug and plug someone else in. And so, I mean, I guess if that becomes an issue later down the line, we'll definitely visit that. But, but I don't foresee that being an issue. And we'll probably add it to the best practices if it does become an issue. Okay. Yeah, we don't have that issue either. But I, I agree. I don't think we would be giving preferential treatment. Um, so what you know, Brian said is, it depends on how far people are coming. Uh, Tesla's, you know, their um, technology is um, strong enough that they don't necessarily have to charge when they come down. I don't know, most vehicles now, I think for Tesla's go over 200 miles on a full charge. So I don't know how many people live 200 miles away from the job. Um, but, so they really don't need to be charging. I do find them in our spaces, but uh, you know, the EV owners, the other groups will actually leave notes on everybody's cars that says, hey, you know, you shouldn't park here, you don't need a charge, or they'll send emails uh, to people a lot telling them that too. So it's okay that they have those conversations. We have had no fights. <laughs> um, but it, it's good that they're, they're working it, they are working it out themselves, and they're talking to each other about it. It's our responsibility just to make sure that, you know, we're providing it and managing the stations um, that uh, does meet their, their demands. Great. 
so I know uh, you've touched briefly on the scalability of your workplace charging program, and I know that uh, several of you mentioned that you have plans to scale that up, but what what was your kind of design process as you thought through kind of the, the initial installation and maybe as you think about kind of taking steps to add chargers? Uh, and and um, I know at least one of uh, one of your companies has a DC fast charger. I'm curious the utilization rate of that and how how you're managing that. So for us, um, you know, it, it, it was always a challenge. <laughs> um, you know, we did the same thing. We added a few. We retrofitted a couple that were already on the campus, um, and then we did surveys. But you know, obviously, you're not going to get a hundred percent response rate on your survey, so it's only a little fragment. Um, and so we learned early on, I mean, we phased in probably three, now soon to be four phases of installations. Um, and we learned early on to just add in the infrastructure early on so that when the need does come up, you know, we just, the infrastructure is already in place. Um, and then we have a new campus that we're building across the street and we're going to put at least the same level of like percentage of chargers that we have now, but also add in infrastructure should be needed in the future. Um, and we do have a DC charger that actually came, it was part of a requirement for a grant that we got on um, from the Department of Energy um, for some of our other charging stations that we received. Um, it's not as highly utilized, but I think that's because that one actually does charge. That's the one charger that, that has a fee associated with it. Um, you know, it is used, but not as often as the others. So that one's a one-time flat $5 per session. Per, per use. Mm -hmm. What about scalability on your program? Um, so yeah, you know, similar again, it was a, a demand thing. So what we do is I'm tracking, I've, I've built a, a program already, so I'm tracking headcount. So I work at the planning department and figure out where our headcount's going to be uh, each year. Um, so because charging stations really need to be based on your employee headcount and not maybe number of parking spaces or square footage. It's really based on how many employees you actually have. Industry standard out there says anywhere from three to 5% of your employee base will be driving electric vehicles, and that's today. I mean, that could go up um, in the next uh, couple of years as technology gets better. So based on our headcount, uh, we have figured out if our headcount doesn't change, I still need 140 charging stations um, to be able to um, accommodate everybody that will eventually be signing up for that. So we just have it scaled out on when our headcount is supposed to increase and that's when we do it. Um, however, as we are building um, our new campus, um, we have infrastructure that's already being put in place. So the first garage that we built, and we only opened 13 charging stations day one, but we had the infrastructure in there for a total of 25 stations. So I'm just bringing them on, you know, little by little um, as, as we need them instead of giving too many. If you give too many up front, people then start to feel, I can just park there all day and I never have to move. And it's harder to break them of that habit than it is um, to keep them sharing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, I mean, we have plans obviously to, to expand depending on you know what the need is. I mean, like I said, we have about a 75% utilization rate. It actually went down. When we started, it was higher and it's gone down, but part of that is because of there are more drivers, right? So uh, we'll have to evaluate and determine whether that, how that, how that changes over time. And if it starts to get, you know, kind of near the top, then we may, then we're going to figure out our schedule for, for the budget for implementing more stations. I mean, the, the, the challenge is that I think this first go around and putting in these 31, you know, in discussions I had with people is that it, this was sort of the easy, those are the easy locations. And you've taken care of those around all of our different buildings, then it becomes a little more complicated. Um, and then you have to take up parking spaces from other spots, and so it becomes more of a challenge. And so having, for us, having good, I think having good data and figuring out, you know, what are we going to really need, um, you know, we are, you know, getting close to that three to five percent range, so uh, we, we'll help determine you know when we we invest and do the additional installations. Yeah, that's a good point. Is is location? Um, I know we'll probably talk about that a little bit, but um, how you structure your stations and where you put them yeah. from a facilities perspective, as close to the building as possible, is really the best because it's less cost for infrastructure. But a lot of these owners, I'm hearing, they're telling me, I don't care where you put them. Put them in the very back of the parking lot. We'll walk. But you know, you, it's more expensive to get infrastructure out there. So again, if you know you have an opportunity to look at where your infrastructure is, um, and also place them so as you have parking spaces, not against a wall, but in the center of a of two rows of parking spaces. So you can you can have dual chargers all the way down, and maybe have four spots per dual charger. So four cars can park there, and they just you know plug in and plug out, so they physically don't have to move their their vehicle. So that's another you know thing to think about. Well, I mean, just to add something yeah. along the same line is that 
you know, the installations we did were that we have about you know, 13 buildings on campus, and there are a number of different locations, but I would, we didn't survey where all the EV drivers were, but I don't think they mapped where they were. So I'm sure there are people that are walking, you know, significant distance from another building to where their building is, but, you know, I haven't, maybe there's grumblings, I haven't heard any real complaints about that. So um, that actually, doing that too, also makes it a little bit easier. If they're willing to deal with that sort of distance, then it's yeah. easier to... They just want it. Push it farther out, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about. Um, everybody wants to know kind of the biggest challenges that you face in doing this, and oftentimes cost comes up. So, can you talk a little bit about how you're doing your rate of return calculations? If that's a big factor in it, if the program has to kind of pay for itself, or if you're factoring in other social benefits that kind of offset the monetary value. So maybe I can start with Claudia. Sure. Um, Yes, there's a lot of costs associated with it. So it depends what you what you put in. So you can do the least expensive route, which is just putting in outlets, basically. And each EV owner has a they get a charger when they buy the vehicle, and they use that charger and they could plug into the outlet. Um, the downside of that is you can't manage a program. You don't know how many people are using it, when they're using it. Um, you can't you know find out when you know somebody breaks it. Um, so there's a lot of downside to that. Um, the other stations that you have um, are the level twos. So those are um, the 240 outlets. So that'll cost you a little bit more because it's a 40 amp. But um, if you go the outlet route, it's uh, again, a lot less expensive. If you go the charging station route, which is a, maybe a networked charger, um, where you can actually get every, it's a web-based system. You can get all the stats that you want online, which is what I uh, think all of us have actually. Um, it's great, but it is a little bit more expensive. So depending on what type you choose, um, it can run you anywhere from six to eight thousand dollars for the station, plus the infrastructure. So you have to understand, you know, again, if your company is ROI based, maybe it's not a good program for you. Um, but if it's not ROI based, then maybe it's okay. It just depends. Then you can charge five dollars an hour um, and make all your money back for it. So uh, ours is really a corporate social responsibility. Um, initiative instead. We're just trying to meet the demand of the employees, tenant, uh, tenant retention, employee retention program. Um, so we're not as concerned with the ROI on it. Um, just want to try to cover our utility costs, which that's why we would be charging a fee. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I don't think we're looking at, at it as an ROI. I think we're looking at it as a benefit for our employees. Um, but to help mitigate some of that, we are putting in some solar technology to, to help um, in one of the buildings that has probably the most uh, charging stations. Yeah, I mean, it's same for us. It's a, it's, a, it's an amenity. I mean, we do obviously do charge back, and so we're trying to at least recover the cost of, you know, the, the electricity, but in terms of the infrastructure, you know, we, we nixed the idea maybe of, of even looking at that because it, it didn't kind of meet with what we were, you know, what we were looking to do. So That's great. So you've all mentioned that you use network chargers, but there's a discussion in the community about whether it's maybe easier, less demand on the utility if you just install a bunch of level one, 110 outlets. So, so that's one view, but you all have certainly taken the approach to install level two or 240 uh, network chargers. What, what kind of was, how did you, what was the tipping point there and why did you decide to go that route? One could theorize that, you know, an employee is on campus, you know, eight hours, nine hours a day, and so you could trickle charge and have them in a position where they could return home fine. Yeah, except some people would have to stay, leave their vehicle there all day. So the whole, then you'd have to have a one-to-one -one ratio. Sure. And um, so in order to mitigate that, um, you want to try to go for level two chargers. Uh, the net, what the network charging does for us is allows us to see what's happening all times. I can go on, like this morning, I went online to go see who was charging. I can see who's there because everyone has to register. You can see the employee's name, when they plugged in, how long they plugged in. You can see how much KW they're actually using. Um, you can pull stats, how long your sessions are, um, how many unique drivers you have. So although I have 81 people signed up, I know in the last week I only had 62 unique drivers. So that means, you know, 18 of them didn't charge in the last week. So there's so many stats you can use and this helps us determine, it helps us with our um, program management. What are we gonna do in the future? Do we need to expand? You know, how is everything going? I have now, you know, one or two stations that are usually open throughout the day, which is great. I've never had that before. Um, so that's really the, I find the um, advantage to having a network station is all the data that you can get from it. Uh, we get uh, uh, greenhouse gas savings um, on there, you can see how many gallons of gas you've saved. So you can use this to motivate your employees to be more energy conscious. 
right? Not that we're asking them to buy electric vehicles, um, but we're asking them to be more energy conscious. And if they know the company's doing it, they're more likely to do it as well. Yeah, we're definitely a data-driven company, so I think <laughs> I, I'm going to mirror what she said. It's just it's a matter of knowing what to plan for, um, and then in addition, efficiencies for our employees. So they they also have that data, and like I said, they're now looking to see how they can kind of hack the dashboard in some way so that they, they can get alerts and be more efficient about their charging. Great. I know that uh, some of the network service providers uh, also provide an opportunity to do kind of managed reservations. And I'm, I'm curious if that's something that you all have, have utilized in your program, if you have and scrapped it, or if you is something that you're looking to do in the future. Or I know you're managing through your social media platform, uh, seems to be working for now, but can you make a comment on that or two? Sure. So there is a reservation system um, where you can, employees can go online and reserve a spot at a particular period, at a specific time. Um, I don't, I'm guessing you guys looked into this too? Um, and we decided that we didn't want to do it. So there, there's a couple of problems with it. Um, one problem is you actually get charged for that reservation. So if you, you know, text in, I want that station at 8.30 in the morning, it'll hold your reservation for 15 minutes, but it does charge you. So when you get to work at 8.35, somebody's car is sitting in that spot because they know that reservation will um, release itself in 10 more minutes, and then they get to charge. But the person who originally made the reservation still gets, a, still gets charged the 30 or 40 or 50 cents, whatever it is, to make that reservation. So um, what we've, from um, the people that I've talked to who've tried the reservation system, it actually created more problems and more fights among the EV owners because someone said, hey, I reserved that spot and now you're in it. Um, and so it did become, we, at first it sounded like a good idea, but um, we've decided not to move forward with that. And the one company I know that started the reservation system has actually uh, now removed it um, so that they don't have that problem anymore. Mm. That, you looked into that yeah. too. It's, it, I think we wanted to outsource to the management to the community. Okay. Yeah. You know, we're trying to meet their needs to so let them handle that. And I think reservations would have been. I mean, looking at how people, you know, someone's late to work because of traffic or what have you, that that messes up the whole thing. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily. Uh, I, I think making sort of an honor system, if you will, between these EV owners has worked a lot better than mm -hmm. having people to reserve a spot. Okay. Great. I know that some some organizations. Um, uh, that are using the network chargers. Typically, you have an RFID card or some kind of authent authentication mechanism to have access to the charging unit. Are you offering uh, charging only to your own employees, or do you also offer it to the public? For example, I know there's a company here in, in Mountain View that uh, their charging stations are open only to their employees during the day, but then uh, you know, on Friday nights and the weekends, they open it up to the general public, and I think they probably increase the fee or something. But I'm curious if that's something that you're doing. If so, why? If not, you know, um, is it something you'll do in the future? Yeah, currently we don't, um, and so we offer. We have also visitor EV charging spaces, but they can also park in in any of the other normal EV spaces if they're open. Um, but no, we're not currently charging. I don't think we're looking to to do that in the future. So a member of the public could pull into Facebook and charge right. if there's a space and a mm -hmm. charger open. And then we have 24 seven security roaming. And so the only thing we ask is that they don't stay overnight. Yeah, ours are, ours are private. So only Juniper employees can use them, but they do use a charge point card. So, and that charge point card can be used for any charge point station. Um, but they do have to request access to our stations in order to use them, so we do not allow them to be open to the public. Yes, yeah, same thing. And we, we've hidden from the, we use ChargePoint as well, we've hidden from the network. You can go on their map and find all these stations. You can't find ours. That's correct. You have to put in a, an ID name and then request access and then you get access. And I think, you know, uh, I think there's also a liability question around that as well in terms of, you know, you don't want somebody, you know, you don't want something to happen, or at least ask the lawyers, you don't want something to happen sure. to somebody coming on your property that's not covered. And we have a, our process, we have a waiver that all employees sign to wait, you know, release NetApp from any liability in case they shock themselves or scratch somebody a car. And, and we can't police that with uh, public, so. Great. Well, I do want to save a few minutes for uh, questions from the audience, but before we do that, um, can, you, can you each just maybe name one of the top one or two challenges you faced and then kind of how you've solved it and any kind of creative solutions you've come up with in solving any of your kind of initial challenges that you've had in implementing your programs? 
I think demand is probably the, the first one. Um, but also permitting, so, you know, our permit process probably with the city takes about four months minimum. And so when we know that the infrastructure is there, you kind of have to plan far enough ahead so that, you know, the permitting process goes through. Um, fortunately, like I said, we've got a pretty good group of EV owners on site, and so they're definitely willing to share where needed. I mean, if somebody says, hey, you know, I can't find a, a, a plug and I need to get at least this far, typically somebody will step up and, and allow them to do that. Ours has probably been etiquette, uh, charging station etiquette. I know we all talk about that quite a bit, um, but that's been resolved now that I have a few more stations. But um, as I said before, you know these owners just ended up creating their own distribution list, end up talking to each other. Um, I helped them create an etiquette um, platform. And so our signage out of the charging stations actually has that etiquette. Basically, it's use your common sense and be considerate. Uh, move your car when it's finished charging. Uh, it's another advantage, actually, of network charging, which I don't think we forgot to talk about, is the um, network charger will actually give an alert to the EV driver when his car is done charging. So they'll know automatically, and the um, etiquette there is within an hour or so that your vehicle has finished charging, go ahead and move it. So I do think etiquette's probably been one of the biggest challenges, um, and resolving it by getting a distribution group, um, getting our EV council, so we have a representative of the EV drivers that will help make those decisions and um, uh, keep our program meeting the needs uh, of the drivers. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of our challenges obviously was figuring out how to do pricing, um, but I think we've solved that, and, and people are into their, hand, you know, they lo everybody love it to be free, but it's, but it, I think it works out for them, um, you know, and it's obviously this, how do we scale and how do we, um, and figuring out the right process to, and you know, we wanted to have a procedure in place to manage getting new people, and that was, it took us a little while to work through that. So. Great. Well, I think we have um, some roaming mics in the room. Uh, we'll take a few questions. If, if you have a question, please raise your hand, state your name, your title, uh, your affiliation, and please uh, direct a specific question to our panel. Hi, John Mashey, uh, TechVisor. A um, uh, quick question. I mean, one of the things that I'm struck by is how Silicon Valley companies have now become urban planner and transportation providers. Right? Is that fair to say? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a certain element. I, I, I'm curious, uh, have you seen the book, uh, The High Cost of Free Parking by Don Shoup from UCLA? No. Yeah, you might ought to look at that because there's some interesting lessons in terms of pricing and behavior and a, a lot of other related things. The other one is, I don't know if you've run into them, that little company Streetline, the ones who make the parking sensors and you know, know whether a, a car is there or not and have a lot of information systems and a lot of statistics on how people behave. But uh, th those, those two things are things you might want to look into because um, I, I think there may be some good synergies uh, of their kind of stuff with you know, again, the much bigger role that companies are now taking on in driving um, uh, trans transport infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah, we've definitely, we've looked at Streetline ourselves um, and we're, we're going to hopefully test or pilot that option for our... There was a question here. I, I, I got the mic here. Over there. Um, okay. Please. Okay, can I go ahead? Yes, yeah. right. we can't see you because of the lights. The lights but, are too bright. Oh, maybe I walk over here. <laughs> or maybe there's something supernatural going on. <laughs> uh, please, please state your name and your uh, My and your name's position. Paul Grant. Uh, since 2006, I've been an independent energy technology due diligence consultant here in Silicon Valley. Prior to that, I had a 40-year career with IBM. That's 40, not 14. <laughs> and uh, I'm uh, one of the co-inventors on the international patent for high temperature superconductivity. That career was followed by 12 years at uh, Electric Power Research Institute. I have a client. Uh, it's a famous US university. It's not Stanford. It's not Harvard. But they have a proposal they want me to uh, look over where they're proposing to have inductive charging, not plug-in, but inductive charging under the street. Right. The proposal is um, more or less directed to urban parking uh, you know, in, stri in, in, in strip topography. Uh, by the way, one of the um, professors involved is a former uh, undersecretary of the DOE for science. 
Uh, my question is simply this. Would this be useful in a wide area commercial environment like uh, uh, your companies have? Specifically, um, you're talking about inductive charging? Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you know the physics involved, right? right? Yeah. Okay, so that we just drive over it and it charges the car. Right, uh, I have heard of that technology actually. For us and for technology companies, I don't know that that would be the right um, way to go with this because it is a little bit more expensive. You probably have to make them public. I could see that working in uh, retail, mm -hmm. uh, hotels, that sort of environment. I don't know about technology companies. Right. It's, I mean, pretty much have the same employees, hopefully, coming every day to work. So yeah. having a fixed infrastructure system versus, you know, uprooting the <laughs> the pavement and everything else, and it's, it's, I think it makes more sense for Our it. companies move around a lot. Okay, fine. <laughs> Physically, the buildings move around no, a lot, no, right? No, so. no, you've answered my question. Okay. Thanks for helping me do my job. Sure, no problem. Thank you. There's a question there in the back. Oh, it's a Tesla, Tesla. lady. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start here in the front, actually. I'm sorry, we had two at once. Yeah, um, Jan Pepper from Silicon Valley Power. I have two questions. I guess uh, one for uh, Brian about the pricing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how you decided on what the pricing would be. And then the second for all of you is how you selected the vendors and if you had an RFP, if you considered at all operating the stations yourselves as opposed to having a vendor operate it for you. Uh, and the pricing was a, it was a, uh, Ongoing process internally to discuss, and I think I think uh, everybody who was engaged in it uh, uh, came down to the idea of you know not charging for the infrastructure and charging for the average for the building. It would be for dealing by building by building. Then you have issues with people going, well, I'm going to charge at the at the cheap building versus having the average. So it's much made much more sense that way, you know. And they're obviously not trying to recoup all the money that went into it, and obviously not the electricity since we're using an average. But that gets us at least you know some sort of control and management of. Of engagement. So, um, you know, in terms of vendors, you know, we looked at a couple of vendors. Um, we also did some benchmarking and talking to other companies and their experience. And and really, charge point we charged was the one that kind of rose up in terms of met what we were looking for in terms of the, the price of the actual charging stations and the quality and you know the concerns we had maybe with some of the other vendors and, and the network aspect was a benefit as well. Did you want to answer? Um, yeah. yeah, go ahead. I can answer. We have two different types of chargers. Um, like I mentioned, the DC charger, uh, fast charger, wasn't necessarily one that was, you know, in high demand, but it was part of the DOE grant that we received with Blink. Um, and so, yeah, it just depended on the on the type of grant that we got and how we chose our ours. But again, same thing. I mean, we wanted to make sure we spoke with other companies to make sure that that the charging stations were um, were definitely capable of of what we needed, so. There's a question there in the back. Uh, yes, hi, Josh. Uh, thank you for your idea of having um, uh, 120 level one outlet uh, uh, for the parking lot, and I uh, uh, support your idea. And I think uh, the, the corporation or company should have at least 40 to 50% of their parking space that has electrical plug. And actually, right now it's happening on Castro Street. If you see every, every tree under, uh, under the tree, there is electrical plug there. So think of it, charging stations are very expensive, but if you put 120 volt plug there, and uh, you know, they, they, they can just sit there all day, they don't have to move their car, they can concentrate to do uh, the, uh, what they need to do at work, and also uh, it's much, much cheaper for adding 120 volt uh, outlet than a charging stations. And uh, you're, um, uh, you're saying that, yes, the power you cannot monitor, and, but there are a gazillion of uh, um, energy monitor device out there that you can like put a CT uh, clamps per, for each breakers, or as, uh, uh, you know, a, a voltage sensor and um, current sensor. You'll be able to monitor how much energy is going to your EV charging. So uh, I just want to uh, say I support Josh's idea uh, of the 120 volt charging, and I hope um, all, all three of you would consider bringing this idea back to your employers and to have like 40% to 50% of your parking space to have 120 volt. And you do need to have 240 volt for the sales and marketing, 
and employee who need to uh, go to see doctor in the middle of the day for them to charge and for visitor of course like me and um, I just want I been, we've been EV driver for a long time like in 2000 from 2000 so we love plugs and we, we, we have an antenna and we can see the plug very easily so um, thank you very much Thank you for your comment. I just want to say I wasn't necessarily endorsing level one only in parking uh, lots as the solution, but it certainly is something that comes up as a topic of conversation and uh, potentially a way to solve some of the some of the issues. So let's take one more question here, I think up front. Hi, I'm Oren from Center for Resource Solutions. We're a nonprofit in San Francisco. Um, I heard solar mentioned just very briefly a couple times. I'm wondering, is that something in terms of renewable energy that's being discussed amongst your employees and um, have you considered either on-site generation or maybe renewable energy certificates to match the electricity that's going through the, the charging stations? Sure. Want to go first? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we definitely looked at it. I think it was a matter of space on our campus for us. Um, and so we're actually installing the solar panels that we have that we have going in soon um, on the roof of one of our buildings. But it's and we also have that for our fitness center to create warm water. Um, but it's just a matter of, I think, space for us. Um, and I mean, obviously cost as well. But but yeah, we definitely want to do as much as we can in that area. It's just been a challenge because of our campus. <laughs> In our garage, we actually have uh, solar panels installed on the roof of the garage that supplies power to the garage lighting and to the station. So I guess I could te technically say I use solar power for the charging stations. Um, but I, I have seen um, that, I, and what I would like to see the technology grow into is a solar panel on the station itself that's built in, it's integrated to the station. Um, those are very expensive today, um, but that's where I think the technology should go, um, get this stuff off the grid, really. Um, if that's really you know where we're headed to, I don't know that you can make 110 solar, but <laughs> we could try, right? Okay, <laughs> we'll talk after. <laughs> okay. Great. Did you have a comment? Or? Uh, with same problems. I mean, roof space obviously is limited, and the RO, talk about ROI calculation on that. It's that's a harder sell, I think. Um, so. Great. Well, still think, looking. Oh, I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm still looking. Great. Well, I think we're out of time. The next session is supposed to be in here in a, about four minutes. So uh, let's give a round of applause to our engaging panel and discussion. Thank you.